now that you've been introduced to Dublin Core and you've seen how metadata records can be constructed using Dublin Core, and we've talked about how to select values for elements, we need to get abstract again. We need to talk about the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative abstract model. And I'll provide a link to the page on the Dublin Core site that provides more detail about the abstract model. But that page says that the DCMI abstract model is, quote, an abstract model for Dublin Core metadata, unquote, and, quote, an information model which is independent of any particular encoding syntax, unquote. Now, those sound like they're mutually exclusive, but they're not, and let me explain why not. So, first of all, the abstract model is obviously a model. Um, it's a model that allows you to show conceptually all of the constructs, all of the things that need to be contained in the universe of any metadata schema. Right? The model is intended to be universal. It's not intended to be specific to Dublin Core. Uh, so in theory, it doesn't matter how this model is implemented. It could be implemented in the syntax of Dublin Core. It could be implemented in the syntax of any other metadata schema in the world. But, and this is an important but, it's used as the model for Dublin Core. Right? So it's written to be a generic model, but that is the generic model on which Dublin Core is built. And the reason for that high-level abstraction is that it makes it easier to then extend Dublin Core and to provide crosswalks between Dublin Core and other metadata schemas. And I won't explain what a crosswalk is right now. We'll get into that later. But here's the point. If everyone thinks about metadata the same way, if all metadata schemes are built using the same ideas about what exists in the universe, then it becomes easier to exchange data. Now, think about language, right? In his book, The Discipline of Organizing, Robert Glushko um, has a very nice example um, about speakers of the Australian Aboriginal language, and I'm sure I'm going to pronounce this horribly wrong, Gugu Yimithir. I apologize if I've mispronounced that. Let me do a little bit of, of drawing here. So this is supposed to be a compass rose. So the point of Robert Glushko's story about Gugu Yimithir is that that language does not have words for left and right. Um, instead, uh, speakers of Gugu Yimithir use compass point direction, north, south, east, west. So, you know, here's me, that's my nose, and if I'm facing north and I want to say turn left, I would say turn left, where a speaker of Gugu Yimithir would say turn west, right? On the other hand, if I'm facing south, and I want to turn right, I would say turn right, where a speaker of Gugu Yimithir would still say turn west. Now, I have to say, I think that actually makes a lot more sense than what we do in English, um, where right and left are relative, but that's neither here nor there. The point is, imagine how difficult it would be for an English speaker and a Gugu Yimithir speaker to collaborate on anything involving giving directions. Right? What would have to happen is right up front there would need to be some shared agreement about how to give directions. Right? Otherwise confusion would ensue. Right? The point here is this. If you don't agree on basic ontological categories of what exists in the universe, communication is very difficult, right? And it's the same with metadata. 
Metadata is a way of saying certain things about objects. Right? It's difficult to exchange metadata in different schemas if you don't agree up front about the kinds of statements that it is even possible to make. Right? There is at least one episode of Star Trek The Next Generation that deals explicitly with these kinds of communication barriers across ontological categories. This is the first diagram of the abstract model, and this is what's referred to as the resource model. Now, the first thing that you have to understand is that these diagrams look the way they do because they're created using the unified modeling language, which is a standard way to graphically represent um, object-oriented software. I won't get into it in a great deal of detail, but I will say a couple of things. The different lines and arrows mean different things. So these diamond arrows here mean has a, right? For example, a property value pair has a value and has a property. These triangle arrows here mean is a. A described resource is a resource. And these regular arrows with the open end are labeled exactly how you should read them. A described resource is described using a property value pair, right? So that is how to read these diagrams. A described resource is the thing that you are describing using Dublin Core. For example, the Mona Lisa, right? So a described resource is a resource and resource is a generic term here. Essentially, a resource can be anything. It means a thing, any kind of a thing. A described resource is described using a property value pair. And a property value pair has a value and has a property. And it has exactly one of each. A property value pair has one property and one value. And notice that a value can be of two types. There are two types of value. There is a literal value and there is a non-literal value. A literal value is a string of characters that represent a thing. The term that is used to represent a thing. And the non-literal value is the thing itself, not a reference to it. Note also that a value is a resource, which makes sense when you consider that the non-literal value, the thing itself, can also be a resource. Right? So an example will probably help make that clearer. A value is assigned to a property. For example, we're talking about the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is the described resource. The property is equivalent to the element, so creator. The value of the property creator is, you know, Leonardo whoops, da Vinci. The literal value is Leonardo da Vinci, the words Leonardo da Vinci. The non-literal value is the actual person, Leonardo da Vinci. The point here is that the property value pair is two things. It is the property or the element, and the value that is assigned to that property. And the value is also two things. It is the term that is used as the value, and it is the thing that the term refers to. Right? So the Mona Lisa is a resource, but so is Leonardo da Vinci because both are things in the world. So what this diagram is telling us is that 
a thing that exists in the real world, a resource, can be described using properties and values. And those values also correspond to things in the real world.